Hey, this is P.D. Turner from the Break It Down Show. Boy, do I have a great one for you today. T. Martin Bennett is an author with Brown Books, and he has written a book that is five-star reviewed well over 200 times, a book that's commonly called the best story I've ever read and definitely the best book about World War II I've ever read. You're not going to believe this story. It is incredible, and I can't wait for you to hear it, so I'm going to keep this really quick. Standard things apply here. Please, if you want to support us, go to the website, sign up there. Go to iTunes, subscribe there. Go to YouTube, subscribe there. But most importantly, buy this book. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. This book is incredible. The story, I just can't get enough of it. This will become a movie. If you like World War II, get this book. If someone in your family likes World War II, get this book for them for Christmas. You will not regret it, I promise. Old Pedro promise. I'm going to start asking directly to you guys. I'm going to start reaching out and saying, hey, join me on Save the Brave. Give five bucks, 10 bucks, 15, 25. Give a small amount of money each month to help these guys out. We're trying to keep warriors alive. Get these guys to see that their lives are worth living. Will you help me with that? Small donation each month. Okay. Brown Books author T. Martin Bennett here for you now on the Break It Down Show. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is T. Martin Bennett, author of Wounded Tiger. I'm on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, this is fantastic. Let me first say that I didn't push record, so this is take two, and it's my fault, openly. And then let me just also say this, Tom Reale, thank you so much for helping set this up. He's, in fact, an associate producer of this episode for connecting me to T. Martin Bennett, who wrote the book Wounded Tiger. And I'm going to follow suit with what everybody else has done, because I I think it's just a fantastic starting point and a, a great way to say, how the hell did you come to write a story about a Japanese pilot who led the invasion on Pearl Harbor to open World War II? Yeah, good question. A lot of people ask me that question. So the summary of the story is Wounded Tiger is the true story of the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor, whose life was changed by an American prisoner and by a girl he never met. So this guy hated America, loved bombing Pearl Harbor, but after the war, he ended up becoming friends with Americans. He raised his kids in the United States. They became American citizens. And it's like, well, that's a huge turn of mind and your whole life. How could that happen? So I've spent about 14 years in this story. I've written the screenplay. I then novelized it to the form of a book where it's since won a book of the year award, a national award, highest five-star rating of any novel on Amazon, at least that we can find. And I'm in talks with investors to get the film done. So what happened was how I came across the story is I grew up just being attracted to true stories. You know, a lot of us, is, is something about a true story, Pete, wouldn't you say that it just kind of gets you of like, wow, it really happened. So when I read fiction, it's like, well, anybody can make up a fiction story, but a true story, you don't have the option to make those up. Those just kind of, that was the sizzle to my stake. I, I love that kind of story. So I stumbled across this story some years ago. And I thought, wow, this would make a great film. So I started researching it. And the more I researched it, the better it got. And I thought, this is a crazy story. I don't want you to go past this point, though. You stumbled across this story. Please tell us about this fall that you had. Well, I like history. I like biographies, whether it's in a book or whether it's a documentary or a docudrama or a biopic. And I came across a used book from a defunct publisher online, and I ordered it, and I stuck it on my shelf. And one day, I just pulled it down and started reading it. And uh, this book came out in the 70s, and it was about this guy, Fuchida. And he was handpicked by Yamamoto to lead the Pearl Harbor attack. He was the number one pilot in the Imperial Japanese Navy. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm thinking this guy is... It's just going to be a bunch of bombs, planes, and ships. But but that's not what it was. It was much of a character-driven story. And how he came about to a complete change of heart and mind is quite astounding. In fact, if it were a fictional story, it wouldn't work because people say the odds of that happening are like 10 million to one. It would never happen, except it did. So that's how I came across the story was a used book. And, and then what I did is I tracked down this author who was a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. 
And I said, I wanted to interview him about this, this guy's life because he had met Kuchita. He said, Martin, you can meet with me, but you're never going to do a movie because it's too hard to do. No one can do it. And I said, well, just humor me and let me, let me interview you. So I went out to the University of Pittsburgh and he said, Martin, you're wasting your time. You're wasting my time. It can't be done right off the bat. So I did the interview with him for about two hours. And at the end, he kept saying, Martin, you're asking all the right questions. You are on the right track. You're the only person I've ever met who's ever done this. And he was completely behind me. I have his endorsement. Uh, his name is Don Goldstein. That's in the uh, dust jacket in my book. So let me just give you an overview of what the story is, but you can jump in and ask me any questions about what happened here. But there's three plot lines in the story of Wounded Tiger. Uchida's life is one of them. And he was a rising star in the Imperial Japanese Navy. He hated America. And one of the questions I've, already, I've always had, and maybe you had, when I was in high school, we talked about Pearl Harbor, and I'm thinking, what are they doing over here? Why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor? Were they trying to take on the United States? How could they ever do that? We would destroy them, and of course we did. What were they thinking? It just never made any sense to me, and I couldn't find many books about it later on. But once you understand what happened and why, you start getting a different picture, and I'm not justifying what the Japanese did, but it's a very, very different picture than what you get in most history books, if anything at all. Mm. So I wanted to know why he did that, but he's only 50% of the story. Then about 30% of the story is a guy named Jake DeShazer. This guy was on the Doolittle Raid. Do you know what the Doolittle Raid was? Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, you're older than 30. Yeah, yeah that's true. Most, <laughs> most people... Under 30 don't know what the Doolittle Raid was. And for those people, it was the first counterattack by the United States against Japan after Pearl Harbor. Right. So Pearl Harbor was December of 41. The Doolittle Raid was in April of 42. And America didn't really want to fight Japan at that time. They weren't prepared for it. We were fighting in Europe. But what they wanted to do was to make a statement to the Japanese people, to the military, hey, we can get to you. So they sent these planes over, about 16 planes, to bomb a number of cities just to shake them up and was very effective. On one of those planes was a guy named Jake DeShazer, and his plane ran out of fuel. They jumped out of their plane over occupied China, and they became prisoners of the Japanese being captured in Chinese territory. So he's the second plot line. The third plot line. Let me, let me say this. All of these planes, this whole sortie that went over there, all of them were one-way missions. They were going to have to land somewhere over there. They weren't going to come back. So Exactly. Exactly. It was, a, it was a scary. And these planes were brand new, which sounds cool. But right. when they're mechanical, they, they were not really dialed in. And they weren't sure if they were even going to get there. Yeah. So it was a very dangerous one-way. You're exactly right. A one-way trip. They took these twin-engine planes off of an aircraft carrier. They knew they couldn't land on a carrier. And they took off like 400 miles early because the, the fleet was discovered by Japanese picket ships. So the whole thing was kind of knocked off kilter from the very beginning. And that's one of the reasons that Jake DeShazer, they ran out of fuel because they, they took off too early and they never made it to their landing spot. And he ended up, and his whole crew ended up in Japanese prison camps and they were tortured and it was horrific. So that's the second plot line. The third plot line is the Covell family. And they were teachers. They were missionaries in Japan. They loved the Japanese people. They served the Japanese people. They went to the worst parts of town to help people. But when they saw that Japan was ramping up the war, they said, man, we got to get out of here because we're Americans and they're going to start killing Americans. So they fled to the Philippines where they thought they'd be safe. But what happened was that's, that's where the Japanese attacked. And even though MacArthur was there and tens of thousands of soldiers, the Japanese still swept in and took over the Philippines. And no one was really prepared for that including MacArthur, who retreated to Australia. So before the Japanese invaded the Philippines, the Covell family sent their children to the United States. So now the daughter of this family was in upstate New York. And ultimately, it's what this daughter did that came back to Fuchida after the war that started to change his whole mind about everything. And I can't say what that is because it's kind of a giveaway. It's right. very, very interesting, though. So you got three plot lines. They have nothing to do with each other. Eventually, they all come together. 
Hey, this is Pete. Real quick, I just want to let you guys know we are proud to announce our official support of Save the Brave, a certified nonprofit 501c3 with a charter of helping veterans with post-traumatic stress. Here's how you can help. Go to savethebrave.com, click on the link on the website, and my recommendation is this. Subscribe. Give them 20 bucks a month. You've got subscriptions you can turn off right now that you're not using that are $20 a month. Swap that out. Get involved. Let's help these folks out. So you got three plot lines. They have nothing to do with each other. Eventually, they all come together. Just like the classic like ensemble cast movie where all these separate lives weave together at the end. Like, uh, I don't know. There's so many great ones. Valentine's Day comes to mind. But let me back up a little bit and ask you a little bit more about... So we had a show a while back with the historian who specializes in World War II, especially the Pacific Theater. And I was asking him, what is it, given the behavior of the Japanese soldiers from that era, hatred is the word you used to describe Peter early on. Um, you know, we know we hate Nazis. They're always bad guys. Even in our social vernacular, the zeitgeist today, you're a Nazi, right? It means something. But you wouldn't say, oh, you're a zero pilot. You know, somehow Japan, despite its own history of atrocities and putting the, the obvious uh, our atrocities aside from World War II, but um, how did Japan and guys like she managed to in mass get out of that. I mean, these these people went and they they committed genocide all over the Pacific Rim. So, what's your sense? How come we don't have? How come history's been kinder to the Japanese early World War II efforts than they have to say the Germans? That's a good question, Pete. And I don't know that I can. I've thought about that before. Why they they got up easier? The fact is, we talk about the six million Jews, which was horrific. But we don't talk about the 20 million Chinese that were killed by the Japanese. I mean, it's the number of Chinese that were killed wholesale, unarmed civilians, and many in horrific ways, cutting their heads off with swords for practice. I mean, right. and I've read many accounts of this. Yeah, you're exactly right. I don't know. I think part of it was the fact that they did not have a, I say, a textbook like Mein Kampf that they were going by that was just like dripping with hatred. And they were more focused on simply expanding their empire and their marketing campaign, for lack of a better term, was what they referred to as the East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. <laughs> it's an English tongue twister, but that's what they were promoting, the, a, uh, the East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. And what they're saying is Asia is for Asians, not for the white man. And so that was their false pretense to say, hey, you know, Malaysia coming into Southeast Asia, into all the Pacific Islands and everything, we're going to liberate you. The Philippines, we're going to liberate you from the white man. So a lot of people are like, that sounds cool. We're in. But the Japanese were just warlords and they just abused and, and took and raped and pillaged and took all the oil and rice and everything, sent it back to Japan. So they did you know, they weren't doing anybody a favor and no one wanted them. Once they were there, they wanted to get rid of them. But why they didn't end up with the same association the Germans did, I don't know. Following the war, though, the Americans were very eager to establish a democracy in Japan and to quickly go through this war crimes trial thing where, as in Germany, and we had those war crime trials that were video is filmed and, and promoted and sent all over the place. In Japan, they kind of fast-tracked it because they feared, that is, the Americans feared that the communists would be coming in through Korea and into Japan, and Japan was going to be given autonomy to pick whatever government they want, and America and the world feared they might opt for communism. So they said, let's just fast-track this deal, help them get back on their feet, defend them, and then, of course, we immediately went into Korea to fight the communists in North Korea. So Maybe for that reason, they didn't get all the publicity, the negative publicity of war crimes trials, which they did, con which were conducted, but they weren't, I don't, they just weren't promoted and they weren't filmed. I've not seen much footage of any Japanese war crimes trials. I've seen some, but not much. And I don't really have a good answer for that question. But the fact is now, just like the Germans were, you know, favored nation status between Japan and the United States as between the U.S. and Germany. But no, there is no Hitler. Hirohito, I think, should have received a lot more blame and responsibility, and he kind of squeaked out of the whole deal and ended up saving his, his hide. I'm not sure that that was justice, and I think that's another factor, because Germany has their Hitler, but 
Japan doesn't really have a Hitler. Yeah. They have a bunch of guys who did bad things. A lot of them killed themselves. Hirohito is kind of like when the war's over, gee whiz, I didn't know all this stuff was happening. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah. And so he kind of squeaked out and he survived. And, you know, he wasn't divine anymore, but he wasn't associated with somebody like Hitler. That's for sure. Yeah. And do we have somebody to, to point our finger at? It just seems the, the strategy was so short-sighted. I mean, why would you go to Guam and start cutting people's heads off? Why would you go to, you know, all these different places and just be so brutal with these people if you intended to expand? It's almost like, you know, <laughs> it's like we tend to do. You know, they go storming into somewhere. They get the advantage, but they act like such assholes once they're there. Of course, there's going to be incessant uprising and undermining of what they're trying to do. And now you've got these thousands of miles, you know, I don't know. It's not an archipelago, but this problem of all these different places you're trying to control. It just seems like they picked the worst possible way to try to, to try to accomplish that. Well, the Japanese were influenced by the Germans and they saw the Germans in their blitzkrieg sweep across Europe and controlling Europe. And when Germany was at its apex, it looked like it worked out pretty great for them. They were in charge. All the railroads were bringing goods and, and paintings and people and money and gold all being sent to Germany. And the Japanese said, we're going to be the same way. We're just going to expand ourselves. And the Germans, of course, were harsh and they dominated and controlled people by fear and, and terror. And the Japanese figured they would just follow suit on that. And it was part of their culture as well. They figured that they would just get the subjects to give them tribute and it would just be one big empire. But the problem was, like you're saying, they were expanding over you know, thousands of square miles of ocean. It was very difficult to get goods and people in between these islands. They didn't have the oil, they didn't have the government, and they didn't have the disposition to maintain anything like that. But I think that they felt that they could just control people with fear and terror and like the Germans did. But of course, the German empire was on the verge of imploding at that point, and they didn't realize that. And it was a mass miscalculation. Yeah. Plus, you, you, you enraged the industrial power of the world. So you have to manage all of these singular places. And then you, know, you welded a melting pot of people that didn't necessarily want to fight anybody into this uh, massive fighting force that just, you know. Yeah, so, so one of the things that was interesting for me is yeah. I went to Japan. I met with an author who wrote a book about what led up to the war, and I interviewed him for a day. We went to three different museums. And the Japanese had the mindset that at the time before America was involved in the war, America was divided. Most were isolationists saying, hey, listen, World War I happened. All those guys killed each other and nothing changed. We're not going to send our men over there to get killed. It's not our problem. It's not our fight. It's not our war. We don't want to be involved with all these fights in Europe. And although some people wanted to help, Roosevelt wanted to send goods and munitions to England. and They figured out a way to do it, but they didn't want to send people over there. The Japanese said the Americans don't want to go to war. If we just take out their ability to wage war, that is sink the Pacific fleet, we can sweep into Southeast Asia. And then within a few months, we'll just have a peace accord with the United States. Say, hey, from now on, we're not going to attack you. You don't mess with us. You can keep Hawaii. We're not going to take it. But we're going to sit on Southeast Asia and the Philippines and these other places. And they just figured the United States would sit on their hands and not do anything. That was the calculation. But it did the exact opposite. It got America off the bench and said, okay, that's it. America rolled up their sleeves, says, we're going into Europe, we're going into the Pacific, and we're gonna we're gonna put an end to this. So it was a it was a massive miscalculation. It backfired. The Japanese were not prepared to fight the United States. They never expected they would have to fight the United States. They just figured a preemptive strike would be enough to tell the Americans, hey, keep off the turf, you take that side of the Pacific, we'll take our side of the Pacific. And let's just call it even Steven. That's what they expected to happen. And it never did. What's your sense for how did Japan see us in general? I mean, obviously the division thing, but in terms of being a long-term partner, did they envision, you know, we went to war with England twice in our founding, you know, inside of 45 years or so, you know, but we're siblings, you know, like our countries are, are bonded forever. 
did Japan envision some kind of like, you know, we're going to have to sort this one thing out, but after that, you know, we can do business with these guys. Well, what happened was when World War I took place, Japan was an ally of the United States and Japan had their own industrial revolution that was a little bit later than America and Britain and France, but they still ramped up quite rapidly. And what happened was after World War I, there was a treaty about how big your navy could be because there was essentially it was an arms limitation type agreement. The United States and Great Britain were allowed a certain size, but the Japanese were relegated to a second tier status. And that was very offensive to the Japanese because they felt like France and Germany and England and the United States were like major league baseball, but Japan was minor league baseball. You're not allowed to have a big Navy like us because you're just not that big of a nation. So there was the League of Nations, which was the precursor to the United Nations. And I have this in my book. The Japanese representatives put forward what's called the racial equality proposal. And part of the tenets of the League of Nations they were proposing to be was that all races are equal. That's essentially what the racial equality proposal was about. So most of the nations said, yeah, we agree to that. But a few nations said, no, we don't agree to that. And some even said vocally, you know, a brown man will never be equal to a white man. But even though a majority agreed, the president of the League of Nations, the working president said, because this is too too important, it has to be unanimous. So we're not going to pass the racial equality proposal. Well, the person in charge of the League of Nations was president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. And that was really a slap in the face to all people of color, especially the Japanese, who essentially wanted club membership into the world system and and the world, you know, the developed nations and the big markets and big military. So that was the beginning of a long fuse that blew up in the Pacific War. Wow. Yeah. As you try to look at the scale, and I'm going to ask a hard, unfair question, so feel free to like spit it back at me if it doesn't work for you. But how much culpability do we have in our own entry into World War II then? I mean, you know, nations have to sort things out and it's easy to look in, you know, a hundred years later and go, boy, what a bunch of assholes we are. But in reality, you know, how much of this do we own? You mean the responsibility of the war itself? Yeah. Like, you know, in terms of, you know, our approach to seeing Japan as being this inferior country, smaller, I mean, those things are are facts, you know, they take offense to it and it leads to their decision-making that brings this world war about, but how much of that does belong to, I mean, was, is our agreement in any way typical of the time or is that just. So I mentioned in the early part of the book, and another thing on on the book Wounded Tiger is, although it's a true story, it's written in the format of fiction. Mm. So it's a nonfiction novel. It's a dramatic story along the lines of Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. It's a true story, but the format is fiction. So I just want you to know that. Okay. So in the story, I do mention some of the things leading up to the conflict. And what happened with Japan was they were expanding their empire into China. Now, Mm. when we would look at China, Westerners, we see this big giant outline of a huge nation. Mm -hmm. The fact is, it's comprised of hundreds of subcultures and language groups, and it was not a unified nation back in nineteen, you know, the nineteen thirties and forties. It was it was broken up into many different segments, and they had poor unified government. So the Japanese came into northern China, into Manchuria, and they called it Manchukuo. Now Mm. they invaded they conquered. And their justification was, we're doing what everybody else is doing. The (laughs) British colonized India, the Germans are colonizing, the the Dutch are colonizing, uh, America's colonizing. We're just colonizing. We're just going to expand our empire. And then the world powers like the United States, hey, wait a second. No, 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 no. You can't do that into China. And the Japanese were, why not? You do it. Everybody else is doing it. It says, well, we're just saying you can't do it. So it was hypocritical as far as, you know, when you're asking where does the responsibility lie, I don't mind people going to other countries and giving people options. But when you're going over and just flat out taking the nation, yeah, and then it's a different deal altogether. And that's pretty much what the Western powers did. I mean, the uh, Africa looks like a checkerboard of Western nations from, if you look at it from a map from 100 years ago, everybody was just cutting up slices and biting off chunks and just consuming this Mm -hmm. whole continent 
mm -hmm. so the Japanese felt like, well, everybody else is doing it. Why can't we do it too? The United States say, you got to back out of Manchukuo or we're going to cut off all the raw materials we're giving you, yes. specifically oil, tin, steel, gasoline, etc. And they, they couldn't back out because they would be losing face. It would be an insult to the people who have sacrificed their lives to expand the empire. And it would also make them look subservient to the United States and the Western powers. So they said, no, screw you. We're not leaving. So then we cut off all the oil. Well, then they said, well, now what are we going to do? Now we have to expand into Southeast Asia, into the oil fields of Indonesia and Malaysia, or we're just flat out going to die. Or they could have retreated from China. So obviously where we are today is the era of colonization is over. You can't do that. Mm. There is what we, the United States calls nation building, which in my opinion doesn't look very successful. I think we can influence by action and helping, but not by forcing people to do X, Y, or Z. So that kind of sets up the deal. But to be honest, what Japan did in northern China was not, it wasn't a positive thing. They weren't doing it to help out the Chinese people. They wanted to take the coal, they wanted oil, they wanted raw materials, mm -hmm. and it was not a good thing. Mm. Uh, so I'm not justifying Japanese expansion. And I think that the world powers like the United States and Great Britain were correct in saying, hey, you can't expand like that. But what they didn't do is saying, hey, we should not have done what we have done. and We need to turn over these territories. For example, the Philippines were a U.S. territory pre-World War II. Well, how did we get that? That's a whole other history book. But, you know, the United States was out there doing that. So I think that it was difficult for the United States says, telling Japan, do what we say, but don't do what we do. Uh, yes. Yeah, that was sort of my next thing I was going to ask you about, because first off, 13 years, dude, holy cow. Thanks for doing all that work to tell us this incredible story. It's remarkable to have this, uh, this conversation and know that there's someone out there who's crazy enough to go after this thing for as long as you have. because. We need more of these stories. I, I think about Clint Eastwood's, you know, movie about Iwo Jima, you know, and, and the two perspectives. It, that's like one of the few times when you really get to understand that. Point yeah, letters from Iwo Jima. Yeah, I, what's interesting is a friend of mine said she wanted to connect me to her husband's ex girlfriend, who grew up to be Clint Eastwood's script supervisor. Mm. I said sure. So she connected me via email. I asked to send a copy of the script to her. I got her address. It turns out she lives five minutes down the street from me here in Franklin, Tennessee. Huh. <laughs> so I met with her in a local restaurant. She said, Martin, I wouldn't say this, but it wasn't true, but this, you're an outstanding writer. You're a really good writer. So that uh, was kind of cool. But yeah, Clint Eastwood did that letter to Iwo Jima. He did it at the same time he did Flags of Our Fathers. So we got the American story. And then Letters from Iwo Jima was the Japanese story. And that, yeah. that film was done quite well. It was nominated for an Academy Award. Wounded Tiger shows the Japanese side behind the scenes what's going on, but it also shows the American side of Jake DeShazer and how the Americans ramped up. But it ultimately is a character-driven story of how Jake DeShazer's life changed, how Pachita's life changed, and how this Koval family's daughter was a catalyst in Pachita's life. So this guy, like I said, he loved, it was the highlight of his life at, the, at that point in his life, a bombing Pearl Harbor because he felt felt like the Americans deserved it. But later he regretted what he had done. He wished he had not participated in the war. He saw that it destroyed his nation, destroyed others. And how that came about is very, very interesting. Without exaggeration, Pete, I've had literally dozens of people tell me, and you can see the reviews on Amazon, best story I've ever read in my life, best book, most inspiring story, best World War II story. Had a guy write me, says, Martin, I've read hundreds of World War II books. This is the best one I've ever read. And I've had people read the story two and three times and others saying, when's this movie coming out? This is a movie I want to see. It's mm -hmm. kind of along the lines of Last Samurai. East, yeah. West, war, drama, character arc is redemption story. And so I actually have met with the president of Warner Brothers. I'm meeting with investors now. If you happen to have $3 billion, let me know. That's what it takes to get the train out of the station. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I have thirty dollars. <laughs> thirty? Yeah, no counterfeit money now. I can't do that. <laughs> no, but, just thirty. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm. I, I yeah, have thirty. Uh, I've actually had some funded offers on the film, but they weren't the right people. So I'm holding out to get this thing done without compromise. We will get it done. 
And by the way, 2020 is the 75th anniversary of the end of the Pacific War. So there's going to be a lot of attention on um, Japan, Japanese history. And we're hoping to have the book translated and out in Japan for the summer of 2020. So that's another thing we're trying to do right now. Yeah. Actually going to Japan next month. And that's part of what we're trying to work on. Going into this story, let's first also say this, because if people look around at your background, they'll see that even as a little kid, you are not afraid of an adventure riding your bike off down the beach in Newport Beach. And your mom like, where the hell is my kid? You know, so you don't mind getting on the road and seeing what happens. So going to Japan to get this story is one thing. What were some of the things that you uncovered? Maybe they didn't make the book where you were just like, I have to wrap my head around this whole thing. Because if you're anything like me, like you pour all this stuff over, you get a sense of the story and then revelations continue to come at you months and years later. We are like, I just put this together. I didn't think about it, but it just arrived. Now I understand this part better. Are you talking about anything or the Japanese? Anything with the Japanese end of the conflict, like all the things you you brought in, like what, what do you now know that we may not realize, you know, based upon our. Well, there's certain things about Japanese culture that when you first look at them, you think these guys are just crazy, insane, out of their minds. And then you start looking at it a little bit more closely. You start thinking about it. It starts changing. And until pretty soon, it's like the exact opposite. And one of those is during the war, toward the end, when they became desperate, they started these kamikaze pilots. And they would basically load up a plane with explosives, and they just crash it directly into a ship. Yeah. And the newsreels that were shown in American theaters that we've seen later talk about these people who had blind obedience to their emperor and they were just killing themselves in these crazy bombing things. And you're thinking, man, what's with these kamikaze guys? They're all killing themselves. However, if you look at the United States and you say, what kind of person is going to get the Congressional Medal of Honor? It would be somebody who gives up their life to save the lives of other people. Yeah. You know, Uh, and that's what these guys did. And many of these guys, these kamikaze pilots, believe it or not, were among the most highly educated in society. Why? Because the Japanese protected their students who are the next generation. If you're a university student, you didn't go to war until they ran out of soldiers. And so what happened? They were emptying out the universities and they they didn't give them an option. What they would do in Japan is says, we're asking you to volunteer to be a kamikaze pilot. But in Japanese culture, when the government asks you to volunteer, you're going. That's just the end of the story. So the thing that turned around in my mind is, one, these guys were just crazy to actually I've seen translated letters. These guys write to their families uh, before they go off to be kamikaze pilots. And these guys were not crazy. They loved their family. They loved their kids. They loved their wives. They loved their country. They saw their nation being destroyed. There's no way we can stop this war unless we can stop these Americans. I'm going to give up my life to save my country. So really only God can determine whether or not this person is a good person or an evil person. But I think an American could put themselves in that place if if we were backed against the wall and we were being attacked by a country. And the only way to stop these guys is to say, we're going to put you in a plane with a bunch of explosives. And that's the only way you can save the lives of your family and your friends and your nation. You would do it. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. An American could put themselves in that place if if we were back against the wall and we were being attacked by a country, and the only way to stop these guys is to say, we're going to put you in a plane with a bunch of explosives, and that's the only way you can save the lives of your family and your friends and your nation. You would do it. In yeah. fact, when I was reading about the Doolittle raid, Jimmy Doolittle, when he's telling the pilots, he tells them specifically, if your plane is hit by anti-aircraft fire and you realize you cannot make it to the field, back to the field, I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm going to find the best target I can find and crash my plane right into it. Right. This is Jimmy Doolittle. So he's talking about kamikaze, doing a kamikaze with his plane before the war even, you know, when it was right at the beginning of the war, before the United States had even attacked Japan. So I think that's one thing that my mind changed. I'm not saying I'm pro kamikaze. What I'm saying is I understand a lot better why these guys took these desperate measures to try to thwart the onslaught of the American attacks. but it was in vain. 
And they were human beings and they were doing what they felt was the best thing they can do. And like I, can, like I say, only God can judge the conscience of a person doing those things. But it's not as crazy as it once looked to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, boy, man, it's, yeah, it is. That makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad you said that because you're right. How many people said, especially from that era, your country is under attack, whether you started it or not, who cares? I'll be damned if I'm going to be damned sitting here doing nothing. I'm going to go out there. And if that means, I've got to give my life up. I'm thinking about Harold Bray, who is from my hometown. Actually, I should say I'm from his hometown. He was on the USS Indianapolis, and it was sunk, and no one knew about it. And him and about 600 of his friends were floating out in the ocean. He actually had been in the Navy like eight minutes. This was his first thing, you know? So oh, he'd man. barely been in the Navy. He was sleeping up top on the deck. You know, the Japanese uh, sub gets him and, and that ship is gone in 12 minutes. So he went from right. taking a nap, trying to stay, you know, not so hot to floating in the ocean for five days. And he survives obviously, because otherwise we wouldn't be talking about him. He says in my show, he says, I never told my parents, they never knew about it. And to me, as a combat guy, I get it because so many people didn't get to come home. He's not going to make a big deal about it because it would be inappropriate for him to do so. But to my non-combat friends and to John who co-hosts the show with me, He's like, hey, dummy, shut up. He never told his parents. So it's just sort of that same mindset where like, I don't want to be the guy who doesn't give everything to fight for my country because this is the fight of our, our generation. I, uh, I get that. That makes a lot of sense. And it, it, it takes the crazy out of the kamikaze and it turns them into, you know, just very determined warriors. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get that. And, and a lot of men who were involved in the war, they never did want to talk about it. It was just a nightmare that uh, they couldn't get away from. So I'll tell you, one point I, I wanted to make is right now in American culture and world culture, it seems that people philosophically, politically, and everything else are becoming more and more polarized. It seems to be getting worse and more intense. And nobody really seems to know how to fix it because nobody wants to admit anything. We're just attacking the other guy saying, what an idiot you are. Nobody wants to say what an idiot I am, which is a, that's the point of humility. And humility really does open doors. So Uchida, he hated the United States with a passion. Yes. And obviously he, he led the Pearl Harbor attack. He also was tapped to lead the Midway attack. And he was right in the center of that whole thing. He could have or should have died on multiple occasions. In the story of Wounded Tigers, also Jake DeShazer, he was like any other red-blooded, male American. As soon as Pearl Harbor would bomb, he said, I want to go over there and kill Japs. That's all I want to do. Kill Japs, kill Japs, kill Japs. He ended up doing volunteering for the Doolittle Raid. He became a prisoner of war. And in his own words, he said, while he was in solitary confinement, he was, quote, crazy with hatred, end quote, to the Japanese people. Huh. So the question is, how did Jake DeShazer and Mitsuo Fuchida go from that point of pure hatred toward the others to ultimately Uchida raised his kids in the United States. They became American citizens. Jake DeShazer, after the war, went to Japan and lived there for like 20, 30 years. And ultimately, Jake DeShazer and Mitsuo Fuchida met and shook hands as friends. How did that happen and why? And I think that the polarization of this world could learn something from that. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to, right? Because otherwise you end up just in that exact same scenario where we're either fighting each other or, you know, something that we're not minding because we're, we're too focused on being offended takes off. And, and now we all have to band together regardless of our, you know, our differences and go deal with the, uh, the bigger problem. Right. We all, we, it's only one planet here. We got to get along. Yeah. <laughs> I worked in a federal prison for seven years, Pete. And you know what? If you work in a federal prison, you learn to get along with people. You know why? Yeah. Because if you don't, you get killed. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and then just professionally, someone who's obstinate and hard to get along with, you know, those people can succeed, but that's not a path I would choose. I'd rather be someone who's collaborative and, uh, and trying to understand, I don't got to approve of your particular means of accomplishing this or your stance on that. But, but I do have to appreciate that, that it is your position. And I'm positive that no one thinks that my position is perfect. So Let's all slow down a little bit and not be quite so angry at everybody and try to let, let's find a problem we all can agree on and, and get after it. And 
who cares about the ways and the means let's let's get to the ends that we want yeah but you know unfortunately uh we we just seem right now to not want to try to do that uh let me ask you a little bit more about the the background of the background of the book because this is interesting to me. So, thirteen years going into this at day two, I'm going to write a book. I'm so fired up. You've completed the outline. What would you want to tell that guy, the guy who just got started? Like, hey, this is going to be thirteen years in the making. Make sure you really want to do. Like, what what, what do you want to say to that guy? Because most books don't take thirteen years to write. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, first of all, the vision was the film first. I wrote the screenplay first, then I novelized the book form, but I've been working on the whole project for, it's like 14 years right now. And I guess part of my thinking is there are millions and millions of books out there. Mm -hmm. The world doesn't need another book. Okay. And there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of movies. We don't need another movie. Yeah. But there's always room at the top for something really, really good and really well done. So I thought, if I'm going to do a movie, I'm going to make sure this is the best movie I can possibly make. And if I'm going to write a book, I'm going to make sure this is the best book that I can possibly write and make it worth people's time to read the book. So they don't feel like after they've seen the movie or read the book, they kind of roll their eyes and goes, well, that was stupid. That was a waste of time. Why did I waste my time reading that or watching that? I watched a movie last night. Had, it was a classic movie, highly rated. I watched it. I thought it was just kind of dumb. It just seemed dumb to me. <laughs> so kinda... I thought, I don't want to do that kind of deal. And uh, there's a saying, you may have heard this before, but I think it's a great saying for people who are creative people. And this goes for the screenplay and the film and the book. Mm. Write the book you want to read. Make the movie you want to watch. Yeah. Mel Gibson said when he did Braveheart, that's what he did. He just made the movie that he wanted to see. So don't take a poll and say, well, what does everybody else want? What does everybody else like? And just try to please everybody because you can't possibly envision what everybody else wants, but you know what makes sense to you and what's interesting to you sure and enough. what right. can be a benefit. Also, I tried to look for ways that, I mean, one of the reasons I like history is you can learn from it. And it's a much better, you know, when you see some video of somebody making a stupid mistake on a skateboard or a bicycle or changing lanes in a car and it wrecks their car, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm not going to do that. You know what right. I mean? In history, we can learn these things and say, you know what? Let's not do that again. So we can learn from those things. So I try to, when I write a story, give people the lessons learned in there as best as possible. So when you're done with the book, it's not like just an entertaining story, but that you learn something, not just the information, but maybe you learn some life lessons of, you know what? There's a better way to do things, and I think that would be a better way to treat people or do things or whatever it happens to be. And you'll see in the story of Wounded Tiger a number of people who changed their minds about things. Some people got better. Some people got worse. Some people live. Some people die. The cool thing about a true story when you're reading it is you don't know who's going to live and who's going to die and who's going to turn out good and who's going to turn out bad. But, but to answer your question as far as somebody looking at down the road, a, a movie is very difficult to do. Gladiator, which is a film I really like a lot, that mm -hmm. thing was in development for 15 years. Yeah, right. So just because it's a good idea doesn't mean it's going to get done quickly. And if it's worthwhile, then it's going to be it's going to take time, and it should be worth your time. So for me to go through the journey is a matter of it's going to be worth it when it's all said and done. And the fact that it's taken years is nothing new. Thomas Edison went bankrupt, I think, four times. Henry Ford went bankrupt like three times. And all these guys went through a lot of hard things that are really difficult in order to achieve something that's really good. So if you're a writer, if you've got a great inspiring story or something you feel can help people or entertain people or contribute to their lives in a positive way, if you do mediocre or just pretty good, it's just going to be lost in history. Nobody's going to care. But if it's something outstanding, really good, then you're going to have the opportunity to help people. And hopefully it will help, you know, help you make a living at the same time. Right. Shoot for excellence. Shoot, you know, there's always room at the top. You know, the cream rises to the top. So I'm not saying I'm a great writer. Uh, I will say this is a great story, though. And I did my best to tell it. Uh, after I did the first edition of the book, I went back and revised the book. And without exaggeration, Pete, I made about 50,000 edits on the wow. book. Wow. 50,000 edits. 
and I added another 10,000 words. I did research and added over about 250, 270 pictures are in the book. And my whole focus was what can I do to make this book the best it can possibly be? Because life is short. There are millions of books out there. Why make just another mediocre book? So if you're out there and you have a vision or a story you want to tell, a film you want to make, be excellent at the very highest level and make it something worthwhile that a person is going to benefit from seeing the film or watch or reading the book and not just be entertained, but be benefit in some good way. That's, that's the best I can encourage people to do. Yeah, well, that's a high standard, brother. And uh, we need people like you that are willing to put in. I mean, I don't want to say it's a lifetime's work, but it basically is. I mean, a 20 year career, you know, like it's a military career. There are people that work 13 plus years in the military and retire because of medical things, whatever. So you're in the zone where this is a significant moment in your life and you haven't even got the movie made yet. So it's fair to say that no. for the next seven years, you'll still be working on getting this project to the height that you think it needs. And it sounds like an epic story. I mean, I, I can. It is an epic story. And I've had people from all walks of life, men, women, young, old, Americans, Japanese. And they said, this is just an incredible story. I've had people who read the book. One of the most common comments is, I'm going to read this a second time. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had people read it three times. I've had people read it in a single sitting, even though it's you know, almost 600 pages long. The highest rated book that you can find on Amazon, by the way. The, the highest five-star rating. Highest five-star is 92% right now. Yeah. It bobbles between 91 and 92%. So if you look up any adult novel, look up Gone with the Wind, Great Gatsby, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter. I mean, I looked up dozens and dozens of books. I looked up the top 100 books on Amazon, mm -hmm. and I could not find a novel, an adult novel. I mean, we're not talking cat in the hat. I'm not competing with that. But, you know... It, so even if there's another book out there that's higher, there are very few out there in this zone. The fact uh, that you think people... Cat in the Hat is an adult novel, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying not comparing it to Cat in the Hat. <laughs> not comparing uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, Although I, I do it. like Cat in the Hat. I love Cat in the Hat. But yeah, the book is called Wounded Tiger. There's a Kindle edition. There's a hardcover edition. And look, I'm going to be buying it. I'm just going to wait for the, the show to end so I can push, you know, buy now with one click. Uh, big thanks to Tom Reale for uh, for setting this up. But man, I, I love your story. I love the passion. I love, so a, as, a, as a combat spy, one of my jobs is to gather perspective, you know, and explain to the commander these kinds of things. Like, you know, we want to nation build. Well, it's really tough to nation build from a singular perspective. You have to gather perspective to understand that your goals and your means are in alignment with somebody else's. Otherwise, you're all in conflict, whether it's soft conflict or lethal conflict. So this is a really cool book. It is lengthy at 605 pages, but I imagine there's a lot of notes and, uh, and, and references. Well, there's a lot of pictures account. in it, and the chapters are short. So there's 270-plus photos in it. The chapters are short. Uh, I just got an email the other day. lady said she read it in two and a half days, and she said, this is an incredible story. I'm telling all my friends, you've got to read the book. So it's yeah. not a it's a it's not a long read. It's a, it's a pretty fast read, and it's a fun book. But for those people who so say I don't read books, I said, well, then we'll do the movie, and you can watch the movie. Two quick questions before I wrap up, and and we'll get on to the next thing. But how on earth did this man survive that war since he started it? That's in the book, and it's very interesting. That's kind of a giveaway. Okay, will, well then let's let let people read about that. It is remarkable, though. So okay, so he was on the Pearl Harbor attack. And I'll tell you, this is in the book. Mm -hmm. he, he gets back. So it's like 200 miles over ocean. He, he's flying around Pearl Harbor, he dropped his bombs, and then he circled it because he was the chief pilot. He had to map what was going on. Comes back. And uh, after he gets back to his ship, his engineer tells him, hey, you know, one of your control wires was hit by shrapnel. And the control wire was just hanging by a thread. If that wire had popped, that's the end of his story. Yeah. And we wouldn't be talking about it right now. He, you know, history was changed by that thread of a wire hanging on his plane. So yeah. why did that not break? Right. Uh, well, that was only one of those. He has several brushes of death. Another thing that happened, this is absolutely true. He was in a military meeting making preparations for the expected American land invasion of Japan. He's sitting in this meeting with hundreds of other men. He gets a phone call. And they say, hey, we need you up in Tokyo. We need to talk. He said, fine. So he leaves the meeting and he flies out. 
he leaves the meeting that was in Hiroshima, Japan. Oh. The next day, the city is bombed by the atomic bomb. Yeah. He then flies down the next day. He walks around in, in radioactive rubble for three days. And then a month later, the doctor said, we want to look at you. And he said, why? He said, they just come down to Hiroshima. We want to talk to you. So they said, how do you feel? He said, I feel fine. He said, well, here's all the guys who are with you. And their hair is falling out. They're they got all these red patches on their skin, and they were suffering from radiation sickness, and almost all of them died. He had no effects whatsoever, zero. Huh. And that's when he started saying, like you're asking, why didn't he die? Yeah. And he didn't know the answer to that question. Yeah. Why am I not dead? Well, let's so find out that's the a good answer question. to that question in Wounded Tiger. You know, that's... <laughs> that's... It, it is very interesting, and it's, and it's you know, I, I did... Double, triple check, quadruple check. Because some of the things in the story, I'm thinking, oh, come on, this is this is crazy. Yeah. Are you sure this really happened? And I, <laughs> on some of those points, I did incredible research over and over and over until I was like, man, this absolutely no question about it. Hands down, this took place. That is quite interesting. So then my last question for you is Mitsubo Fushida in Japan, is he known at all? Or is this a story that that you were able to, is he known? That's the question. Well, he is known in Japan. Uh, most Japanese people have heard of him, but whether or not he's a villain or a hero is, is uh, it just depends on the context of how you've heard his story. You have to understand that in Japan, they have a what's called a shame-based value system based uh, as opposed to Western culture, which is a guilt-based value system, meaning I won't do that. It's wrong to do. I would feel bad if I did it. In Japan, they would say that's wrong to do. How would I look? How would my family be affected? How would my team feel? How would my boss feel? They're always looking at themselves through the eyes of other people. So it's shame based. So for that reason, they don't talk about World War II because it's shameful. They lost the war. It's kind of like whatever happened to grandpa in the basement. We don't talk about grandpa in the basement. So I was sitting with a couple of Japanese businessmen and I was talking for at length because they wanted to practice their English. And of course, I wanted to ask questions about Japan. So during the course of the conversation, these highly educated businessmen, I said, tell me roughly how much of, of history of the Pacific War and World War II do you cover in, in school? These guys, again, they're college graduates. This one guy, he hung his head. He kind of smiled and shook his head. He looked up at me and he said, two pages. Wow. Two pages. That's it. This was a cataclysm of, 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 the, you know, of epic levels in Japan. Millions and millions of people were killed. The nations, I mean, cities were incinerated. Yeah. The atomic bombs were dropped. They don't talk about it at all. So getting back to Pachita, what do they think of Pachita? They're just kind of, it's kind of blank. They don't talk about World War II. Because they don't talk about it, it's the forbidden fruit. Now everybody's kind of like, well, what the heck did happen out there? Yeah. So I had a Japanese national who's an English teacher in Japan. She read my book. She absolutely loved it. And in her letter, she said, Martin, I'm going to read this a second time. This was a really amazing story. She also said, I thought you were very fair-handed to both the Japanese and the American. I don't take sides. I just try to lay it you know, out the way it really happened. So how the world perceives uh, Fuchida is kind of a mixed bag. Uh, I don't really see any consistent thing there. But the fact is, people really don't know his story that well. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to tell it in Wounded Tiger. Well, I love it, man. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks again to Tom for setting this up. T. Martin Bennett on Amazon. The book is called Wounded Tiger. If you don't get it, you're crazy. Hey, by the way, don't forget, this is how we work this. You buy the book, you rate it five stars, and then write a few words because that helps people discover this incredible story. And hopefully... We can help Martin get over the hump with his fundraising to get this story told on the big screen because it certainly sounds like look, I, all of the movies in the Pacific Theater are just incredible. It's such a fantastic backdrop to tell the story, but this is a story that I definitely would love to see. Well, we're trying to get it done. If you go to WoundedTiger.com, there is a test movie trailer there made of uh, made from other films, but it'll give you an idea of what the story is about and how it might feel on the big screen. Perfect. Thanks, man. Thank you, Pete. I appreciate it immensely.